page 117. <laughs> Hari Om Narayana. 
पुकारो आव प्रभु सांज सवारे सवारे आओ प्रभु सांझ 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 सवारे
Dear sisters, brothers, and loving children, we welcome you to this morning's satsang. And we're going to have the reading from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. The prayer is on page 13. We'll all chant together. Om Tavakathamritam Tapta Jeevanam Kavi Bhidi Ditam Kalme Shapaham Shravana Mangalam Shri Madatatam Bhuvi Grinantite Bhuvi Dajana The nectar of Dyson effacing utterances brings life and hope to those scorched by misery. They are extolled by wise sages, and the mere listening to them would bestow auspiciousness on all. They confer every prosperity. Those who spread them broadcast are verily magnanimous. They distribute what is completely satisfying to the hearers. Today's reading from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is on chapter 13. We continue from the last time that we read. Uh, it's about the master and M. M is Mahendranath Gupta, the recorder of the Gospel. And the date is August 19th, 1883. It was Sunday, the first day after the full moon. Sri Ramakrishna was resting after his noon meal. The midday offering had been made in the temples and the temple doors were closed. We must remember that if Master rested, it was hardly even for 15 or 20 minutes because within a short while, devotees would start coming and immediately Master would sit up and talk to them. Also, for those of us that have been blessed to visit the master's room in Dakshineshwar, uh, Kolkata. <coughs> we noticed that master's room was, you can say, the bedroom, the lounge, the dining area, the eating place. There was just one room, one smaller cot in which master sat to talk to devotees, and a slightly bigger one <coughs> on which the master rested. So there was no privacy at all. Master was available to everyone at all times. And also when we think about the noonday offering was made in the shrine, we are reminded that Mother Sharda says so and the Master that whatever we eat, first offer it to God and then have prasad. And what does that do? It purifies our hearts and minds. We remember that whatever we have is through the grace of God. So we offer it to God and eat it as prasad. So we've noticed that many people say that they cook the same food at home and they eat at a holy place. It tastes different. Why? Because it has been offered to God and it is prasad. So if there's anything that was not right, when you eat it as prasad, you thoroughly enjoy it. So, and also the temple doors were closed. That means that after lunch, especially in India, it's extremely hot 
at midday. So just as people like to rest after a midday meal, they, God is also put to rest because we see God as living. And as we would treat human beings, we treat God also like the deity. Uh, wake him up in the morning, offer the arati, at midday offer lunch. So this helps us to feel the living presence of God. And also some sort of discipline is there. If you want to see the deity, you must go before 12 or after 3.30. The temple doors open again in India at 3.30. So some people rush to go and make sure that they have the darshan before the doors closed. In the early afternoon, the master sat up on the small couch in his room. So that means the master hardly rested. It's still early in the afternoon and master sat up in his room. M, that is Mahendranath Gupta, prostrated himself before the master and sat on the floor. This indicates humility. I know when our Guruji used to sit here, hundreds used to sit on the floor waiting to listen to what master would say about God or what our Guruji, how he will direct us and help us. The master was talking to him, that is to M, on the philosophy of Vedanta. Master to M. Self-knowledge is discussed in the Ashtavakra Samhita. The non-dualists say, so hum, that is, I am the supreme self, or I am that, that is Brahman, the supreme self. Now we must know, as Hindus, we must know what is non-dualism, and what is the Vedanta philosophy, Advaita Vedanta? Non-dual means not two, only that, only Brahman. Only Brahman exists, we have said this a few times in the previous talks as well, that God himself has become the entire creation. The human beings, the animals, the plants, everything, all of creation only emanates from God. So. Our teachers used to explain how do we understand this when we think about electricity, that power called electricity manifests in so many different ways as a fan, as a heater, as the, uh, the acorn, the stove, the microwave, the sound system, all of that, those are different names and forms, but the power behind it is the same electricity. So similarly, God is only one, but he is so almighty, so powerful, uh, that there's nothing God cannot do. So the entire creation emanates from God, and the whole purpose of life is to know that reality to know that underlying factor is the same Brahman. So firstly, we have to find it in our own hearts. Then if I know oh, it's in my heart, then naturally it is in everybody's heart. And how does all of creation move? How does it work? How does it function? Only because of the presence of that Brahman, that power allows the sun to rise, allows the waves to take place on the ocean, allows fruits to grow, all of that, that is the nature of Brahman, that power. But in itself, you can say, it does nothing or it is not affected. Like we are affected by our karma. Whatever we do, as we sow, so shall we reap. So if we do good, good comes to us. If we do bad, then we get the results of those bad deeds. But Brahman, that aspect of Brahman, which we call prakriti or nature, creates, preserves, destroys, but Brahman is not affected. So Brahman is, that's why Master says, that the non dualists say, soham, I am that supreme self, and Master explains here, this is the view of the sannyasis of the Vedantic school, but this is not the right attitude for householders who are conscious of doing everything themselves. 
That being so, how can they say, I am that, the actionless supreme self? So what Master is saying is that we are still traveling on this path of spirituality. As much as I know God is in my heart, everyone knows we have this firm faith, this belief that God is in us. Therefore, we are assembled here today to remember that supreme power that is in us. But why I cannot say I am Brahman or everybody cannot say I am Brahman? Because we are conscious of the body, the mind, the intellect. I can do this, I can do that, or I can't do this, I'm not able to do that. So we are conscious of the body-mind complex. We are not totally absorbed in that supreme consciousness to know that I am not the body. I am the Atman, and that power is making me do what I do. So therefore, I cannot say I am Brahman, because when I say I, I am talking about my body and mind. I'm not talking about the Atman. So therefore, Master says, Householders cannot say that it is not correct because they know that they are doing what they are doing. According to the non-dualists, the self is unattached. As we just mentioned now, the self does not do anything. It is not attached. Good and bad, virtue and vice, and the other pairs of opposites cannot in any way injure the self, that is, cannot injure the Atman, though they undoubtedly afflict those who are identified, who have identified themselves with the bodies. So it will affect us naturally because our minds are still not in that supreme spiritual consciousness. So we will know that if we see vice, we get affected. If there's virtue, we feel good. So, like Master says, smoke soils the walls, certainly, but it cannot in any way affect akasha, that is the space. It cannot affect, it will be smoky, but after a while, nothing will happen to space. Space will remain as it is, but you will see the stain on the walls. So, we have to be careful not to say, I am Brahman, until we realize that supreme self. Master says, following the Vedantists of this class, Krishna Kishore used to say, I am Ka, meaning Akasha. Being a great devotee, he could say that with some justification, but it is not becoming for others to do so but to feel that one is a free soul is very good. See, Master guides us now. Don't keep thinking that I am bound. I do not know anything. Feel that you are free because the Atman is there. Uh, one day I will realize it, but I like to feel that I am free. And our Guruji, Big Swamiji, used to remind us, free never, never means I can do what I want to do. I am free so I can hurt people, steal, I can do what I want to do, never. I am free to do the best thing under the sun. I am free to do good to the world. I am free to do good to myself. I am so happy because I have this idea that God is everywhere and I want to serve God in all beings. So that gives me infinite joy. That freedom is the right type of freedom according to our Guruji's because it gives you peace of mind and it brings peace to the whole world as well. So Swamiji used to say that those people who are not even conscious of this divinity, they want to do what they want and you'll find that loud blaring music going around forever, you'll find uh, people doing whatever they want, it's not dharmic, it's nothing to do with doing good to the world, and they say, no, I am free. But that is not free because that itself will bind them. When they realize that this is not giving me ultimate peace, I get peace just for a few moments and I think I'm happy, but 
ultimately I am in pain. I am not, I am suffering, I am not peaceful, I am not happy, nobody around me is happy, so that binds them more and more. So for that few moments they think they are happy, but it can never give them eternal joy, it can never give them eternal peace, and especially when you reach an old age, sort of after 60, 70, 80 years old, and you reflect, you think to yourself, what have I done that would I can say is good in my life? So that, therefore, that is not freedom. That is not the ultimate reality. So, Master says, it is good to feel that you are free by by constantly repeating, I am free, I am free, a man verily becomes free. On the other hand, by constantly repeating, I am bound, I am bound, he certainly becomes bound to worldliness, means becomes bound to the things of the world, to the senses, to everything that attracts the senses. The person who says constantly, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, verily drowns himself in worldliness. Because what happens? You say, oh, I am a sinner, so what is there if I say another lie? It doesn't matter. That's so wrong. That's not right at all. We must keep thinking that I am divine, I am pure, I am good. Then you will know that if I am good, I cannot tell lies. I cannot do anything wrong. So we have to remind ourselves of that inner purity. Remind ourselves that we are the Atman. We are not the body-mind complex. In that sense, we can remind ourselves, but not to broadcast that I am it, I am Brahman. We cannot do that, but we have to remind ourselves about that innate divinity. And Master says again, one should rather say, I have chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner anymore? How can I be bound? So the attitude with which we say, I am free and uh, I am uh, divine, that is important. With what attitude we say it? With the attitude that I want to progress. I want to know that I am divine. I want to realize that I am not the body-mind complex. I am the Atman, which is eternal, which gives me absolute peace, which gives me that ultimate freedom. Because you see, the real sadhus, like even master, totally free, but they are not attached to anything. They are not attached to any person, place, or thing. So when it is there, it's good. If it is not there, it's still also good. To M again, Master says, this is very, really amazing how Master's mind works. Master is a Paramahamsa, means a great swan. A great swan, according to our scriptures, the Hindu scriptures, a swan is able to, if there is a mixture of milk and water, the swan can take only the milk and leave out the water. So, Master is a Paramahamsa, a great swan in this mixture in this world of good and bad, of sugar and sand, Master is able to extract only the good. So, he is a great swan that can take only the milk and leave aside the water, take only the sugar and leave the sand aside. So Master is a Paramahamsa. Yet, look what Master says to him. You see, I am very much depressed today. Hride has written to me, to, has written to me that he is very ill. Why should I feel dejected about it? Is it because of Maya or Daya? M could not find suitable words for a reply and remained silent. Now, for a few of us that know, M is Master's nephew, Master's sister's son, who came to live with the Master when Master came to Dakshineshwar Kali Temple as the priest. Hride also came to serve the Master 
to look after him. Why? Because master is to be always absorbed in the God conscious state. Master didn't know the surroundings around him, even whether he had eaten or not eaten. So Hiride used to look after the master. But you see what happens when we don't do sadhana together with whatever activity we do, then that I specialist, hmm? I am this, I did this, I, if I don't look after master, who will look after him? And I have to do this and I have to do that. And also so much so that Hride used to stop some visitors from giving master whatever they wanted to offer to master. He used to say, no, master doesn't need it, or he will take it and put it aside. So, unfortunately, that ego played up, and Hride could not serve master forever. So after a time, and look at what master says here. Do you know what maya is? It is attachment to relatives, parents, brother and sister, wife and children, nephew and niece. But daya means love for all created beings. Now, what is this, my feeling about Hride? Is it maya? Is it going to bind me more and more because he is my nephew? Or is it daya? Am I just feeling compassion for him? But Hride did so much for me. He served me wholeheartedly and nursed me when I was ill. You see, this is like how Gurudev, our revered Swami Nishchalananji Maharaj used to say, if there's a very big white sheet, but there's a black spot somewhere, everyone's attention goes to the black spot. But God sees only the good that we have done. He doesn't look at our errors. We, as human beings, make many mistakes. We try not to make mistakes, but it's just human nature and it happens so. But God only sees the good that we do. God sees our good intentions. Maybe something went wrong, but the intention was good. So, Master, as much as Hride tormented him, Master only says that he nursed me when I was ill, but later he tormented me so much. The torment became so unbearable that once I was about to jump into the Ganges from the top of the embankment. So you can imagine of all people, Master being so tormented, but he did much to serve me. Now my mind will be at rest if he gets some money because Hride is now poor, he's struggling, he doesn't have enough funds, and look at how sorry Master is feeling for him. But whom shall I ask for it? Who likes to speak about such things as money? So Master is full of love and compassion, no matter what anyone does to him, he can only see God in them, and he feeds this compassion. There's a lot to say about maya and daya, but the time is up now. The next time when we have some time, we will talk at length about it. But I just wanted to read a little bit about what Sri Krishna Bhagavan says. This is as a guide for us. The Lord says, the yogi Having controlled the senses, fixes his mind on me. His wisdom is steady, whose senses are under control. This is just for us to know that the senses will tell us to do anything and everything. But we, that means I am not the mind or the senses. I have to tell my mind, oh mind, this is not good for you. Come to the feet of God. God will give you eternal peace eternal ananda means bliss, absolute joy that nobody can take away from me and that bliss does not depend on anyone, anything or any place. It depends on the heart inside that is the Atman, that is God, Brahman. Brooding on sent objects, man develops attachment to them. That is what Master is talking about. From attachment arises desire. When you get attached to something, then you want it. Then from desire, anger arises. Why? 
because now I haven't got it, I can't get it and I want it, so I become angry. From anger comes delusion. From delusion, confused memory. Look at this step by step, the Lord is warning us. He's being very compassionate. From loss of memory, the ruin, ruin of discrimination. So when I forget what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong, what will help me and what won't help me, and from loss of discrimination, he perishes. But the disciplined person, moving among sense objects with the senses under control and free from attraction and aversion, gains tranquility. So we pray to God every day. Therefore, we must do our morning and evening prayers, our sadhana, because that sadhana reminds us of that divine power inside us and how we should be. We should, in the evening, check within ourselves. Did I hurt anybody? But did I say anything wrong? Was that right or wrong? Did it help anybody? Maybe it doesn't mean that the words only have to be sweet and loving and kind. Sometimes you have to say the truth to help that person also, but it must not be out of anger. It must not be out of hatred. It must be out of pure love. May the Lord fill us with love and give us devotion to his lotus feet. Hari Om Tat Sat. Om, page 
sit quietly for a few moments. The meaning of the song is very beautiful. It says, Oh friend, where are you looking for me? I am right inside you. I am very near you. So, in other words, you don't have to look for me outside. Although, going on pilgrimage, repeating God's names, going to temples, mosque or church, oh, helps me to awaken, awaken the divinity in me, but ultimately, I am seated in your heart. I am not in pilgrimages, so you can go to pilgrimage, but have you purified your heart and mind? Have you learned not to find fault with anyone? Not to hurt anyone's feelings? So do that and at the same time look for me in your heart. I am not in all the good work you do and not even yoga sannyasmi, not in that type of renunciation, but I am in that the one who yearns for me, who looks for me in the heart, and I am not in this whole space, but I am in every breath that you take. I am not in a cave, but in every breath you take, think of me. And the last verse says, if you look at for me carefully, if you look for me in the right place, with the right attitude, then in a second you can find me, ekapalaki talashmi. In one moment you can find me. And says the Saint Kabir, Suno bhai sadhu, listen, O sadhu, listen, says Kabir, me tohu vishwasme, have faith, I am in faith. So have the faith that I am in you and you will find me. Jai 
पार्वती पते हरा